This is Music Corona. I'm Robert Carl. This is episode eight, African American composers in the 20th century against all odds. Thank you very much, folks. Here's one of our recordings. Beautiful number called Black and Blue. Hard as lead, feel like golden dead. Wished I was dead. What did I do to be so black and blue? Mm. Even the mouse ran from my house. They laugh at you, scorn you too. What did I do to be so black and blue? Yes, no. yes I'm like inside. That don't help my case. Cause I can't hide what is in my face. But I did, but did that do I say? Yes. How would it end? Ain't got a friend. My only sin is in my skin. What did I do to be so black and blue?
And that, of course, is the inimitable Louis Armstrong performing a work by Fats Waller, by the way, not his own original, but he became identified with it, called What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? Our topic this week is a huge one that this series can only graze, and you have my apologies for it, because it could easily be the topic for a series as long or twice as long as what we're having here. But it's important to realize that in American music, there is a group of creative musicians who had to work in perpetual adversity. They did have real successes, but the degree of recognition that they received and the amount of pushback that they got throughout their careers meant that they were constantly having to find ways of dealing with what was essentially a repressive regimen that was being enforced upon them. Of course, this is in large part about the story of jazz, but not exclusively. And of course, there are all sorts of things in between the cracks. We've already heard Duke Ellington's music earlier on, which truly moves into the realm of the symphonic, even when the orchestra is still the big band. Armstrong's and Waller's song is, in fact, a beautiful pun. Being black, of course, is obvious. Being blue means being down. And, of course, beaten black and blue is another phrase that is common across the language and suggests being abused and downtrodden. And yet, at the same time, there is a certain joy in the way that the sadness is presented, embodied in Armstrong's trumpet, but also in his amazing gravelly voice. So we're going to look at several examples of works that were written by African-American composers are popularized by African-American musicians that dealt with a history of oppression and resistance and moving into what then became the civil rights movement of the post-World War II era. The next thing we're going to have is the singer Billie Holiday and her rendition of the song, Strange Fruit. This was actually written by a Jewish American poet and composer named Abel Mirapol. But he was able to get the song eventually into Billie Holiday's hands, and she was so moved by it that she took it up as a signature tune that she often ended her concerts with. The strange fruit are the bodies of blacks who are hanging from trees in the South, the result of lynching. The lyrics are very powerful and explicit, and let's have them now speak for themselves. Yeah. 
pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth set of magnolia sweet and fresh then the sudden smell of burning flesh here is a fruit for the crows to pluck for the rain together for the wind to suck for the sun to rot for the tree to drop There is a response to injustice that is extremely explicit, but the responses of musicians can vary. They can be deep and heartfelt, but somewhat more abstract. And what we're going to hear right now is a work by the great saxophonist John Coltrane, titled Alabama. This is a surging lament that if you know its stimulus takes on additional meaning. The Alabama of the title refers to the church bombing in Birmingham of 1963 in which four little girls were killed, and it was one of the galvanizing moments of the civil rights struggle. Coltrane takes this into a realm that is far more vast and universal as a surging lament. <laughs> Thank you. 
and of course, the celebration of black culture has come in many forms. And in this case, we move to something of a surprise, though it really shouldn't be. Florence Price was a composer in the first half of the 20th century who, in fact, was trained at the New England Conservatory. She grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, was for a while the director of the music department at Clark University, which is part of Atlanta University, one of the premier all-black educational institutions in the country. And eventually, because of a sense of danger in the South, she and her family migrated to Chicago, as did millions of other black people. And there, she found new contacts and supporters. And eventually, in 1933, her third symphony in E minor won a prize and was premiered by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. It's a relatively conservative piece, but rich in ideas, imagination, tunes, and its third movement in particular has really, I would say, a rich and inventive rhythmic sense. It's a cakewalk, which was a black dance form that inspired all sorts of composers, including Debussy. And you'll see that the use of percussion throughout it has a great coloristic sense. So here is a composer who, by the way, has been lost to history until recently. Her music and reputation is being revived by performers and musicologists, and justifiably, this work needs to be heard more often. Florence Price, Symphony No. 3, Third Movement. <laughs>
for something quite different. 1959, the great composer and bassist Charles Mingus recorded a song called Fables of Phobos. And its original form was not accepted by Columbia Records because it had some lyrics attached to it that, was, that were regarded as too controversial. Faubus was Orville Faubus. He was the governor of Arkansas. He was the man who refused to allow the integration of Little Rock High School, and indeed, ultimately, Dwight Eisenhower had to call out the National Guard to protect the students to actually get them through the door. Needless to say, this was something that enraged Mingus, who was a man of great passion. And he wrote a piece which, like so many of his works, has amazing profile. I mean, the tune, the ideas just are indelible. And this one, with its motivation of righteous anger, and its willingness to call out bigotry and hatred for being truly, as he says, ridiculous and stupid, comes across as a great example of bringing laughter and satire to topple power. Who do we remember when all is said and done? Mingus or Phobos? Faubus only exists because of Mingus now, and I don't think he's happy with that. This is 1959, Fables of Faubus, and it's a real supergroup. Mingus on bass, Danny Richmond on drums, engaging in the verbal back and forth with Mingus, Ted Curson on trumpet, and the amazing Eric Dolphy on saxophone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, no applause and keep it down. Your drinks, don't rally your ice in your glasses and don't ring the cash register. You got it covered? All right. I'd like to um, continue, this, continue this set with a conversation dedicated to the first or second or third All American Heel, Fabus, and it's titled The Fables of Fabus. Oh, Lord, don't let them shoot us. Oh, Lord, don't let them stab us. Oh, Lord. Don't let them tar and feather us, oh Lord, no more swastikas. Danny Richmond? Billboard, Thomas, Bob, Buster, Rockefeller, Burn, Ice. Oh, why are they so sick and ridiculous? Two, four, six, eight. They brainwash and teach you hate. Hey.
Nazi fascist supremacists. Boom, two flood clan with your Jim Crow man. Name me a handful. That's ridiculous, Danny. Why are they so sick and ridiculous, Danny? Brainwash and teach you hate. And here's another case of righteous indignation, again coming from the same period. This is the great singer and composer, Nina Simone. She was actually a brilliant pianist. She had hoped to be a classical concert pianist, but was refused conservatory admittance because of her race. And so instead, she began a career as basically her own one-person band, singer-songwriter, at least as a leader, and with an amazing vocal instrument and also supreme piano chops. She was a force throughout the post-war era. This is one of her most famous songs, and certainly, again, one of the most forthright in its expression. Uh, it also was controversial on this side of the Atlantic. This performance is from France at the Antibes Festival, and the title, you will see, speaks for itself, Mississippi Goddamn. <laughs> Mississippi Goddamn is our last tune. We had some requests for it. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Mississippi gone down. Can't you see it? I know you can feel it. It's all in the air. I can't stand the pressure much longer. Somebody say a prayer. Alabama's got me so upset and Governor Wallace has made me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Mississippi gone down. Hound dogs on my trail. School children sitting in jail. Black cat cross my path. I think every day is gonna be my last. Lord have mercy on the land of mine. We all gonna get it in due time. I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in prayer. Don't tell me, I'll tell you. Me and my people just about do. I've been there, so I know they keep on saying, go slow. That's just the trouble. Too slow. Washing the windows. Too slow. Picking the cotton. Too slow. We're just plain rotten. Too slow. We're too damn lazy. Too slow. Get 
try to say it's a communist plot. All I want is equality for my sister, my brother, my people, and me. You lied to me all these years. You told me to wash and clean my ears and talk real fine just like a lady. And you'd stop calling me Sister Sadie. My country is full of lies. We are all gonna die and die like flies. I don't trust nobody anymore. They keep on saying go slow. That's just the trouble. So. Desegregation. So. Mass participation. indignation. There's also the idea of simply trying to find some way to escape from the oppression. And the composer we're going to encounter now took escape to the greatest lengths imaginable. His name was Sun Ra. He was actually born in Alabama as Herman Blount. But over time, as he followed the black diaspora to Chicago and then to Philadelphia, he gathered a collective of musicians that was almost like a commune, and also an entire philosophy of life and music that became all-embracing and incredibly original. Sun Ra believed that he had been teleported to space, to the planet Saturn, and that he had been chosen by extraterrestrials to preach a new gospel. It is very tied to a movement called Afrofuturism. It is a celebration of all sorts of black cultures. It has a reverence for Egyptian culture. It has a reference to outer space. The techniques that are involved involve highly experimental free jazz and at the same time really down and dirty funk. In a way this music is sort of a combination of the type of free jazz you might have from someone like Albert Eiler or earlier Ornette Coleman with the funkadelic sound of George Clinton. It remains to this day remarkable and influential. And we're going to hear an extended excerpt, it'll be about 10 minutes long, of his song Space is the Place. And like so many of these pieces, the title says it all but we've still got to listen. Thank you. 
Space is the place. Space is the place, yeah. Space is the place. Space is the place. Space is the place. Space is the place, yeah. Space is the place. Space is the place. Space is the place.
Bass is the takes us to the here and now, at least pretty close to it, 2015, a musician named Kendrick Lamar puts out an album called To Pimp a Butterfly, and it is an attempt to encompass a huge range of the black experience and also of black music and the history of black music but seen through the filter of rap and hip-hop. Lamar was to go on in his next album, Damn, to win the Pulitzer Prize. So he is very much an American composer by whatever definition you want to use now. This particular song I'm ending with because it reaffirms a sense of frustration, indeed of rage, at insults and stereotypes that black people continue to endure in our culture. And yet at the same time, it has its ambiguities. If you listen to the lyrics, you're going to see that the criticisms that Lamar deals out go in a lot of different directions. This is powerful music, very much of our moment. It continues a sense of struggle, and it is coming very much from the street. It is from culture that is not the ostensibly sophisticated culture of Ellington but it has a certain sort of savvy that can only come from life lived on the street in the moment. So this is The Blacker the Berry from To Pimp a Butterfly. I'm the biggest hypocrite of 
hypocrite in 2015 Once I finish this witness, this will convey just what I mean I mean it's evident that I'm irrelevant to society That's what you're telling me, penitentiary would only hire me Curse me till I'm dead, church me with your fake prophesizing That I'ma be just another slave in my head Institutionalized, manipulation and lies Reciprocation of freedom, only live in your eyes You hate me, don't you? I know you hate me just as much as you hate yourself Jealous of my wisdom and cards I dealt Watching me as I pull up, fill up my tank, then pill out Muscle cars like pull-ups, to show you what these big wheels about I, Black and successful, this black man meant to be special Cat scans on my radar, bitch, how can I help you? How can I tell you I'm making a killing? You make me a killer, emancipation of a real nigga The black of the belly, the sweet of the juice The black of the belly, the sweet of the juice the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. The black of the berry, the big ass shoot. I saw them shit like a slave, cause we black. Oh, you feel money for pain, cause we black. I'm man, I said them put me in a chain, cause we black. I'm at you now, me go and turn full of rocks. And you know, see the whip, left yard from the back. But now we have a big whip back from the black. Oh, them are so redoomed from the start, cause we black. Remember this, every race start from the black. Just remember that. I'm the biggest hypocrite in 2015. When I finish this, if you listen, then sure you will agree. This plot is bigger than me. It's generational hatred. It's cynicism. It's grimy. Little justification. I'm African American. I'm African. I'm black as the heart of a fucking area. I'm black as the name of Tyrone and Darius. Excuse my French, but fuck you. No, fuck y'all. That's as blunt as it gets. I know you hate me, don't you? You hate my people. I can tell because it's threats when I see you. I can tell because your waist is evil. No, I can tell because you in love with the desert eagle. Thinking maliciously, he get a chain, then you gon' bleed him. It's funny how Zulu and Dosa might go to war. Two tribal armies that want to build and destroy. Remind me of these Compton Crip gangs that live next door. Beefing with power rules, only death settled the score. So no matter how much I say I like to preach with the Panthers, or tell Georgia State Marcus Garvey got all the answers, or try to celebrate February like it's my B-Day, or eat watermelon chicken and Kool-Aid on weekdays, or jump high enough to get Michael Jordan endorsements, or watch BET cause urban support is important. So why did I weep when Trayvon Martin was in the street, when gang banging make me kill a nigga blacker than me? Hypocrite. it for this episode. As always, the lyrics that you've heard are now all accessible online, especially since some of them may not be suitable for younger or more sensitive listeners. Next week, days of love and rage, music from the Vietnam War.